This is a Roll to Hit Gaming first look. In this video, we begin our three part game showcase. The first look covers components, rules, and setups. It is designed to give you a quick introduction to a game you might have interest in. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Let's head into the game room for your Roll to Hit Gaming first look host. Welcome back. I'm Lucas from Roll to Hit Gaming, and today we'll take our first look at a newly delivered Kickstarter from Scott Alms and Gameland Games, Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms. To make a long story short, Gameland took their first Tiny Epic title and wanted to make something that would hopefully land on a mass market shelf. While a better story might involve Wayne Zielinski's shrinking ray gun, we'll stay away from that rabbit hole and take our first look at Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms. Those of us familiar with the Tiny Epic series of games are used to small boxes and small components. But Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms kicks it up, or I guess down, a notch. As you can see, the game comes in a standard playing card sized box. If you have the Kickstarter Deluxe Edition, it came with a sleeve that fits over the box and adds a layer of protection. Inside the box is a pocket sized rule book. This is reminiscent of the old CCG rule books that were included in starter decks. This full color rulebook is well laid out and easy to understand and includes many useful gameplay examples. Also pictured is the War Die, included in the Deluxe Edition. This is used for solo play. Next, you'll find a bag full of small wooden blocks. These blocks are used to track your progress on various tracks. Included are 50 player cubes, 10 of each color, 15 resource cubes, 5 for each resource type, mana, ore, and food, 5 gray action cubes, and one mini tower used as an active player marker. Then you'll find five resource tracking cards, which, as the name suggests, will be used to track the number of resources you have, as well as the war value used in combat. Next up, the action card, which is used to track actions selected by the active player. Also included is a tower card, where players will track their progress in completing their great tower. Then, you'll find the 16 territory cards, each player will be randomly dealt a territory to begin the game, and this is where you will send your armies on quests, collect resources, and engage in battle. On the flip side of the territory cards, you'll find the factions. Since these cards are double-sided, there are also 16 factions, and any faction on the back side of a territory card dealt to a player will not be used in that game. The last component is the compass card, used in the solo variant of the game. As you have seen, basically half of the components are wooden pieces, which are scaled down to the ultra-tiny version of themselves. But they're good quality and will serve their purpose well. The other half are made up of various cards. The cards are a good stock with rounded corners and a protective finish. Now we'll set up and show you how to play a three-player game of ultra-tiny epic kingdoms. Begin by placing the action and tower cards in the middle of the table, as well as the five gray action cubes. Let's take a moment to go through what each action does before we finish setup. Each turn, you'll select an available action which all players can take. The patrol action allows you to move one of your armies into an adjacent region on that same territory card. Note that you cannot move across or into water or over crags. Also, you cannot move an army into a region that already has two armies in it. More than two armies of any color can never occupy the same region. The quest action allows you to move one of your armies from one territory card to another territory card. You can only quest from a region bordering a territory card to a region bordering territory cards and cannot move an army across or into water or over crags. If you have moved your army into a region with an opposing player's army, you attack and start a war. Note that you may never enter a region occupied by an opponent's last army in play, nor may you move your last army into a region with another player's army. You are the invading player, and your opponent is the defending player. Each player will use their hand to cover their war track in order to secretly set their war value. This is the number of resources you're willing to spend fighting the war. Note that your resource card indicates the values of each resource in wartime. Mana's worth 2, ore's worth 1, and food has no value for war. 
players must have enough value in resources and ability bonuses to cover their wager, as win or lose they will be spent. Players can also set their value to the white flag to offer a peaceful alliance, which requires no cost in resources. Players simultaneously reveal their values, and the player with the highest value wins the war and takes or maintains control of the region. In the case of a tie, the defender wins the war. If both players chose the white flag, they have formed a peaceful alliance. We'll cover that in a bit. Win or lose, both players pay their resource cost wagered. The winner takes control of the region and the loser must either retreat or be removed from the region as a casualty. In order to retreat, a player must pay food equal to the number of armies that they have in play and can then move to an adjacent region. This retreat move cannot cause another war. If there are no valid regions to retreat to, or if you choose not to pay the retreat cost, the army is removed from the board and returned to the player's supply. If both players selected the white flag, they have entered into a peaceful alliance. In subsequent turns, an allied player may patrol or quest out of an allied region without penalty. If at any point the allied players have no armies in the same region, the alliance ends. If a player moves into a region which starts a war with an allied player and doesn't offer peace, the alliance ends and all allied regions are in danger from this war. The winning player will take control of all allied regions. The loser must retreat all of their armies in allied regions paying the food cost for each or remove them from the board. If breaking an alliance would cause a player to lose their last army, they may retreat that army for free. The build action allows you to build the next step of your great tower. Note that your tower progress marker starts off the card and a player can only build one level of a tower in a single action. Pay the resource cost as indicated for the next level and place your marker on that level. Level 1 costs 1 ore, level 2, 2, and so on. At the end of the game, you'll gain victory points equal to those listed for your highest tower level completed. The research action works in much the same way as the build action. Pay the number of mana necessary to reach the next level of magic on your faction card. Place your magic research marker on the new level and you immediately gain the new benefit listed. Each race begins play identical to one another, however through magical research each has their own advantages. At the end of the game, a player gains victory points equal to the mana cube shown for the highest level of magical research attained. Note that the final step of magic research provides each faction with a way to earn additional victory points. Taking the expand action will allow a player to place a new army on the board. Pay food equal to the number of armies you now have, including the army you wish to place, and place the new army in the same region as another army of your color. Remember, more than two armies can never occupy the same region, so if you have no solitary armies on the board, you can't place a new army. At the end of the game, a player gains one victory point for each army on the board, except those in ruins. We'll cover the special rules for ruins in our sample turn. The trade action allows a player to trade any number of a single resource type for an equal number of a different resource type. You may only trade once per action. Let's continue setting up our game of Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms. Give each player one randomly drawn faction card, one randomly drawn territory card, ten player cubes, and one of each resource cube. Each player should place three resource cubes on their resource track to represent their starting resources. For first time players, it is suggested that they take one ore, two mana, and three food. Place one player cube below the tower card, as well as one player cube below their faction card marking their magic as zero, and another near their war track. Finally, place two player cubes representing armies on any one region of their home territory. Place the other cubes in a supply nearby. You are now ready to begin playing Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms. The player who most recently swung a sword will be the starting active player. If no such player is available, sigh and randomly determine the start player. On a player's turn, they follow five simple steps. First, check to see that there are available actions, meaning that there are action cubes available in the supply. If no action cubes are available, remove all cubes from the action card and place them back in supply. 
place an unused action cube on an available action space. A space can never contain two action cubes. The Lizard Folk player has selected the patrol action, which will allow them to move one of their armies to an adjacent region. The Lizard Folk player moves one of their armies from its starting position to the adjacent plains region. All players may take the selected action at this time. Any player other than the active player may instead collect resources. The orange player chooses to take the patrol action and moves one of their armies into the ruins region of their territory. Ruins have the following special rules. When collecting resources, players with an army in a ruin may take one resource of any type. Players can only move an army out of a ruin as the active player. Armies in ruins at the end of the game are considered lost and are removed from play before scoring. Ruins are treated no differently than other regions for movement, expansion, and war. The black player also chooses to take the patrol action and moves one of their armies into the plains region of their territory card. Notice that the black player has a capital city region in their territory, which would provide two bonus victory points if they control it at game end. Now that all actions have been resolved, players check to see if any of the following game end conditions have been met. The game end is triggered when any player has all seven armies in play, or a player has completed constructing their tower, or a player has researched all five levels of magic on their faction card. If any of these conditions have been met, game end is triggered and play continues until the next time the action card is cleared. At that point, the game ends immediately and players score victory points. At this time, no game end conditions have been met, so pass the active player token clockwise to the next player and repeat these five steps. The orange player, who drew the orc faction, is next. There are available action markers, so they place an action marker on the build action and construct the first level of their tower, spending one ore. The black player also chooses to build, so both the orange and black players have now built the first level of their tower. The lizard folk player decides to collect resources instead of building. When a player collects resources, each region with a player army provides one resource of the appropriate type. In this case, the Lizard Folk player gains one mana from their forest and one food from their plains. While not applicable in this case, mountains produce ore. No game end conditions have been met, so the active player marker moves clockwise to the black player. The black player drew the Dark Elf faction. As there are available action markers, the Dark Elf player chooses the quest action. Both the Lizard Folk and Orc players decide to collect resources. The Dark Elf player moves their army onto the territory card of the Lizard Folk player. They have placed an army in the same region as an opposing army starting a war. Both players secretly set their war value. Simultaneously, both players reveal their selected war value. The Dark Elf player has wagered two, while the Lizard Folk player has only wagered one. Therefore, the Dark Elf player has won and assumes control of this region. Both players now pay their wagered war costs. The Lizard Folk player must either retreat his army or remove it from the game as a casualty. As they have two armies in play, retreat will cost them two food. The Lizard Folk player pays the two food and retreats his army into the forest. The Lizard Folk player chose to collect resources and will collect one mana from the forest. Even though they have two armies in the forest, a region will only ever provide a single resource. The Orc player also chose to collect resources and will collect an ore from their army in the mountain region and one mana from their army in the ruins. None of the three game in conditions have been met so play proceeds in this manner until one is. Players then score victory points. Score one victory point for each army in play except those in ruins. Also score one victory point for each level of magic researched. Then score victory points based on tower completion and finally score two victory points for each capital city your armies occupy. The player with the most victory points wins. Thank you for joining me for this first look at Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms. Obviously, we couldn't cover every rule in this first look, but hopefully this video will help you decide if this is a game you might like. For Roll to Hit Gaming, I'm Lucas. Have a great one. Thank you for joining Roll to Hit Gaming for another first look, where we go inside the box, through the rules, and onto the table. 
If you liked what you saw and want to see more, please click the like and subscribe button. Find us on Facebook and Twitter and join us in the conversation and the comments below. We'll see you next time and as always, never give up, never surrender.